Welcome. Well, I got a lot on my heart tonight, and I really think it's imperative to get in alignment with what God wants to do here. The journey of our pastoral ministry here in the church known as Families of Faith Church uh, has been a, a crazy ride to say the least, because it started over on Friar and it ended up over here when this used to be the Konzovich Farm, and now we know all the ministries that are uh, that would call this home. Interestingly, there's a handful of things that I do uh, and that Rhonda does on our spiritual journey that's part of our life every day, uh, and it's caused us to have confidence at times that others may have a real struggle. Doesn't mean they're not difficult, but at least we know the direction that things go are for a reason and God is the one who puts things in place. And so a lot of the things that we know as normal um, require us to be surrendered to the voice of God. Amen? And so in that kind of a lifestyle for us is that's who we are. We've learned to be those kind of people uh, because of the calling on our life demands that and nothing less. That being said, I think about the disciples when Jesus called his disciples. I'm going to talk about that a little bit tonight. But initially, uh, the complexity of who they were, uh, the disciples were, would have been religious misfit, misfits. They were out fishing because they, some rabbi didn't pick them to be their understudy. And as a result, when, when the master came along and said, uh, follow me and I'll make you fishers of men or fishers of people, generically, uh, that to them they were excited about that potential. The Bible says they, they laid their nets down and, and they followed him immediately. And I think about what it is to be somebody who is that willing to listen to the Lord and then do what he says pronto. Like the disciples, they had something tied to it. They were going to have an identity that gave them a status in a culture that rejected them already. Amen? So you think of us as, as Gentiles, you know, people that are uh, receive our, our redemption through the blood of Jesus, and we were hopeless before Christ. Amen? And so to understand what was going on in their lives, be it unto God that we would respond like the disciples, that we would recognize that we were hopeless and we were destined to hell. We were foreigners and aliens to God, but because of his great love and mercy for us, Jesus died for us. Amen? Amazing reality. It ought to have an impact on us. We're, where it changes the way we think, we're ready to respond because we got called by the master. Amen? That's crazy stuff. Well, to consider, guys don't like to ask for directions when driving. Amen? They don't want to ask for no directions. Well, I'm older now, and I'm not quite as foolish as I used to be. And I know that Rhonda knows uh, where we're going a whole bunch more than I do. She's got an incredible sense of direction. I do not. But the truth is, I rely on GPS, and I've even watched, I've even watched Rhonda rely on GPS under the right circumstances. Right? You don't know where you're at. You better listen to that thing because it knows where it's at. Right? So if you're on a journey and you have your GPS on, you know, how often do you think you need to listen to the GPS? Oh, always. If you want to end up where you're going, amen? Because at any point you decide not to listen to it, you're going to end up somewhere else. If it keep, Or if it says recalculating, wonderful. You're going to make a lot of U-turns or you're going to make a lot of turns. But if the objective is to accomplish the purpose of God by following God's voice with him, and he is our GPS, we better listen all the time. Amen? Or you're going to end up somewhere you don't belong. And there's a lot of things that direct our steps. I speak frequently uh, on the principles that are found in one of Black of Bees' writings, uh, the Exper Experiencing God series, Henry and Richard Blackaby and Claude King, 
very powerful stuff. But I realized over the years, I teach all my morning devotions, my Bible studies, our life application, and they come from what you would say is the seven realities of experiencing God found in Blackaby's writings. But they don't come from Blackaby. They come from the scriptures. Let's take a quick run through a few of the principles that the realities, I'm just going to tag on them. Pastor John uh, started a series, and it's he's going to be talking about the principles found in uh, the seven realities of experiencing God. We're going to get a crash course here tonight because I'm going somewhere. I want you to be with me. Do you understand what I'm saying? I want you to hear where this comes from and why. Because at any point in our life that we disconnect from God's GPS to lead us where we're going, then you're not going to end up where you're supposed to be. Amen? And there's a lot of things that compete for the direction of our lives. A lot of things that will take us in direction that we think is going to be just great because we haven't considered the bigger picture, the overview. And you know why we don't consider the overview? Because we can't see the overview, right? He guides our steps. He's the lamp unto our feet, those kinds of things. God has the overview, and he directs us, and sometimes allowing the GPS to take you in a direction that every fiber of your being says is the wrong direction, we'll make the adjustment ourselves. amen? And as a result, we're subject to the cause and effect of our own understanding. And I'll just tell you out front, that's a train wreck. It's not something you want to be involved in, is allowing your own ideas and your interests, likes or dislikes, to navigate your journey. It's a very dangerous place to be. And the seven realities, reality number one is God is always at work around you. Uh, John chapter 15, verse 5 says, I am the vine, you are the branches. If a man remains in me and I in him, he'll bear much fruit. But apart from me, he can do nothing. He's always at work around us and it's contingent on us abiding in the vine. Amen. And if we abide in the vine, we will bear much fruit. <clears throat> Reality number two is God pursues a, a, con, a continual love relationship with us that is real and personal. John 17, 3 says, and this is eternal life, that they know you, the one true God, and Jesus Christ, and whom you have sent. And that's one of my soapboxes. They go there. This, can, the, this relationship with him that is real and personal is the objective of God to bring us into an eternal life that is what is eternal life is to know the one true God and Jesus Christ in whom he sent intimately. So here and now, he's pursuing this love relationship for what is eternal. Number three is God invites us to become involved with him in his work. John 14, 21 says this, Whoever has my commands and keeps them is the one who loves me. And the one who loves me will be loved by my Father and I, too, will love them and show myself to them. Number four, God speaks by his Holy Spirit through the Bible, prayer, circumstances, and the church to re reveal himself, his purpose, and his ways. I have some more scriptures to consider. Keep in mind what I'm speaking about. God speaks to us by his Holy Spirit through the Bible, prayer, circumstances, and the church to reveal himself, his purpose and his ways. John 16, 7 says this, But very truly I tell you, it is for your good that I am going away. Unless I go away, the advocate will not come to you. But if I go, I will send him to you. The Holy Spirit came to us when Jesus ascended to heaven after his time on earth, after the resurrection, and his deposit for our redemption is the Holy Spirit of God. Amen. Psalm 119, 105 says, your word is a lamp into my feet and a light into my path. We've talked a lot about that in the, in the last week, about, you know, the Lord lighting our path. It's a relational issue. He's not sending a, a, a beam way ahead. He, he's lighting our path that requires us to walk with him. And then, of course, Jeremiah 33, 3 says this, Call to me, and I will answer you, and I will tell you great and unsearchable things you do not know. You know, you're calling on God. You're saying, I want, I want your wisdom. I want your direction. I want your guidance. You know, we were talking about in morning devotion this week, one of the days I said, you know, when you ask God 
to use me today so that I can show you to this world you better hang on to your shorts because the table of adversity is coming your way. Because he's going to show you things that are going to cause you to die to yourself and take up the cross he's called you to in order that the world sees there's something different about you. Amen? James chapter 1, verse 2 through 4. One of my soapboxes always, you're going to hear some verses. You're going to say, preacher, I hear these verses. I hear you in your preaching. I hear a lot of these verses. And the reason is in pursuit of Christ to accomplish his purpose, to be intimately involved with Jesus and the Father, and to be guided on our journey, these things are required. Amen? So James, chapter 1, verse 2 through 4, Consider pure joy, brothers and sisters, whenever you face trials of many kinds, because you know that the testing of your faith produces perseverance. Let perseverance finish its work so that you may be mature and complete, not lacking anything. And none of us like that. Consider your pure joy when you go through trial. We're not interested in that at all. I don't want the trial. Are you kidding me? And be mature and complete, you mean I can't have a tantrum? Listen, I'm hearing the snickering, and I'm with you. Because that's the way I felt when I was putting this together. You hear what I'm saying? I don't like this no more than anybody else. But it's just the truth, amen? And then listen to this. Hebrews 13, 17 says this. Have confidence in your leaders and submit to their authority because they keep watch over you as those who must give an account. Do this so that their work will be a joy and not a burden, for that would be of no benefit to you. Wow. So in other words, submit to the church leaders. There's leadership. God wants to do something in it through your life, perhaps, through the body of Christ. He's going to ask you to do things that are going to take you on a direction. You're probably not going to like it. But he says to consider it pure joy. In James and in Hebrews, he says, have confidence in your leaders. Why? Submit to their authority because... They keep watching you as those that have to give an account for their actions. Do you hear what I'm telling you? They might think they're pulling the wool over somebody's eyes. They might have ill motive or whatever. But the day comes that they stand before the Father. Amen. You know, I'll let that simmer for a minute. I'm going to throw something out there, kind of unrelated, but kind of related, right? How many of you heard O.J. Simpson died this past week? You hear what I'm talking about now? He's going to give an account for things, and an attorney ain't going to help him this time. You hear what I'm saying? That's reality. So the preacher, the teacher, those who are on this spiritual journey to accomplish the very purposes of God, if they get their own ideas and agendas, uh, you know, motives, whatever, that comes floating in, they will give an account to the master. Amen? So never underestimate the power of God to straighten a mess out and to use your life to be the game changer in somebody else's. Number five is God's invitation for you to work with him always leads you to a crisis of belief that requires faith in action. Let me say that again. God's invitation for you to work with him always leads you to a crisis of belief that requires faith in action. I'm going to have to step out in faith. Faith is being sure of things hoped for and certain of things unseen. So if the dimension you're living in does not require faith, that's a problem because God is going to direct you in such a way that brings you to a crisis of belief. In other words, you've got to come to terms and say this, what do I believe about God? What do I believe about God? And if I believe, if I believe he's the God who spoke this universe into existence, if I believe he's the God that accomplishes all things by a spoken word, well, then my faith is going to have to be manifested, and I'm going to be brought into a crisis of belief when I have to say, I'm going to put my faith where my mouth is. Amen? Here's one that we don't like. I'm not sure I said very much you did like yet. Am I right? I, don't, I didn't hear anybody cheering and whistling, right? So I watch an American Idol. People are, you get a good vocalist, they 
start to make a little hooting and hollering noises. They get into the, you know, the second chorus. Man, they start making noise. Then they're on their feet. They're, ah! they're clapping their hands, right? Ain't nobody doing that here tonight, amen? We ain't interested in this very much. And that's the truth, and that's why we got to have conversations that we can come to terms with these things in our life. And as a result, we can make adjustments, amen? Listen to this. Number six, you must make major adjustments in your life to join God in what he is doing. I'm going to couple different, I'm going to go two different places on this one. Because I, I started out with one already. I started talking to you about it. This is Mark chapter 1, verse 16 through 20. Jesus is calling his disciples. This is a good account. It's in Matthew also, but let me use this account in Mark. Verse 16 says, As Jesus walked beside the Sea of Galilee, he saw Simon and his brother Andrew casting a net into the lake, for they were fishermen. Come follow me, Jesus said, and I will send you out to be fishers of people. At once they left their nets and they followed him. When he had gone a little further, he saw James, the son of Zebedee, and his brother John in a boat preparing their nets. Without delay, he called them, and they left their father, Zebedee, in the boat with their hired men and followed him. These guys weren't playing, man. They got, they got an opportunity to have an identity in a society that had called them rejects. And so they immediately dropped. They seen value in Christ. They dropped their stuff. We're going with them, right? That's an immediate response. They made an adjustment that was major to join God where he is at work and what he was doing. Amen? I'm going to give you another one that's not good. All right? It's a polar opposite, in fact. It's found in Matthew's Gospel, chapter 19, verse 16 through 22. It says, Just then a man came up to Jesus and asked, Teacher, what good thing must I do to get eternal life? Now understand, before I go into verse 17, what is eternal life? To know the one true God in Jesus Christ in whom he sent. That's not what he's asking. He's asking, how do I get to heaven? Right? So Jesus is playing immediately on this man's understanding. So He's answering it away because he's teaching him the depth of what he's saying. Are you guys with me? I speak a lot like that because why? Because I'm a student of the master. And as a student of the master, I mimic what he did. Because I have an intended outcome I want you to comprehend. And so we're going there as Jesus responds. Understand, he's speaking to somebody who thinks they're self-righteous, right? How many of you know the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Christ Jesus our Lord? Amen. Amen. There's none righteous, not one, right? None of us. We're all warrant a place called hell outside of a Savior named Jesus. Amen. So now listen to this. Here's our verse 17. It says, why do you ask me about what is good? Jesus replied, there is only one who is good. If you want to enter life, you see what he says? I don't want to enter heaven. He says, if you want to enter life, keep the commandments. Which one? He inquired, and Jesus replied, you shall not murder, you shall not commit adultery, and you shall not steal. You shall not give false testimony. Honor your father and mother, and love your neighbors as yourself. All these I've kept, the young man said. What do I still lack? And Jesus answered, if you want to be perfect, you want to be perfect, listen. Sell your possessions and give it to the poor, and you'll have treasure in heaven. Listen, then come follow me. Let that one simmer for a minute. Do this. Divorce your life here on earth. Sever. Put that in your rearview mirror. That's not who you are no more. And then come follow me. Right? And he says, Jesus, Jesus said, if you want to be perfect, you do this. Verse 22 says, the young man heard this, and he went away sad because he had great wealth. That, that's the society we live in, folks. Well intended, but when the rubber meets the road, they're checking out too much. Principle number seven is this. You come to know God by experience as you obey him 
and he accomplishes his work through you. You come to know God by experience as you obey him, and he accomplishes his work through you. You always hear me speak of a term that I, I see all the time, experiential faith, experiential faith. Well, well here's a script. Listen, John 14, 23, Jesus replied, if anyone loves me, if anyone who loves me will obey my teaching, my Father will love them, and we will come to them and make our home with them. So listen, once again, you come to know God by experience as you obey him, and he accomplished his work through you. All right, so you're on a spiritual journey. You're walking hand in hand with the Lord. You're not going to veer off the course. Everything he says, it's yes, Lord, you're following him. Whether I like the scenery or not, whether the circumstances look like something I'm interested in or not, doesn't matter. Doesn't matter. I'm going to get to know the, the character of God, the love of God through the circumstances. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to take you somewhere. We're going to dig a little deeper here now. I want you to get your mind wrapped around something that's life-changing life-changing. It's found in Joshua chapter 24, verses 1 through 15. Then Joshua assembled all the tribes of Israel at Shechem, and he summoned the elders, the leaders, the judges, and the officials of Israel, and presented themselves before God. Jesus said to all the people, this is what the Lord, the God of Israel, says, Long ago, your ancestors, including Terah, the father of Abraham, and Nehor, lived beyond the Euphrates River, and they worshipped other gods, small g. But I took your father, Abraham, and the land beyond the Euphrates and led him throughout Canaan and gave him many descendants. I gave him Isaac, and to Isaac I gave Jacob, and Esau, and I assigned the hill country of Seir to Esau, but Jacob and his family went down to Egypt. Then I sent Moses and Aaron, and I afflicted the Egyptians by what I did, and I brought you out. When I brought your people out of Egypt, you came to the sea, and the Egyptians pursued them with chariots and horsemen, as far as the Red Sea. But they cried to the Lord for help, and he put darkness between you and the Egyptians. He brought the sea over them and covered them, and you saw this with your own eyes, what I did to the Egyptians. Let that simmer for a minute. So you understand, when we're talking about the Red Sea, the army's behind them, God parts the water, and they go running through there, and here comes this whole army, and he just drops the whole thing on them. And they're done. Now the scripture says, these people, these people, these, they're pursuing you. You will never see them again. Oh, well, when, a, when a wall of water that's massive falls on you, that's not good for you. I'll tell you, don't mess your hair up too. But they cried to the Lord, and he put darkness. Okay, then they lit. Okay, but he, they cried to the Lord. For help, and he put darkness between them and the Egyptians. He brought them over, the sea covered over them. Then you lived in the wilderness for a long time, and I brought you to a land of the Amorites who lived east of the Jordan. They fought against you once again, but I gave them into your hands. I destroyed them before you, and you took possession of their land. There's a theme here. You see what's going on? When Balak, son of Zippor, the king of Moab, prepared to fight against Israel, he sent Balaam, son of Beor, to put a curse on you. But I would not listen to Balaam. So he blessed you again and again, and I delivered you out of his hand. Then you crossed the Jordan, you came to Jericho. The citizens of Jericho fought against you, as did also the Amorites, Prizites, Canaanites, Hittites, Gergesites, Hivites, and Jebusites. But I gave them into your hand, 
and I sent hornets ahead of you, which drove them out before you, also the two Amorite kings. You did not, you did not do it with your own sword and bow. So I gave you the land on which you did not toil, cities you did not build, and you lived in them, and you ate from vineyards and olive groves that you did not plant. Now fear the Lord and serve him with all faithfulness. Throw away the gods of your ancestors, small g. Worship beyond, the ones they worship beyond the Euphrates River and in, Jesus, in Egypt and serve the Lord. But if serving the Lord seems undesirable, undesirable to you, then choose for yourself this day in whom you will serve, whether the gods of the, your ancestors served beyond the Euphrates or the gods of the Amorites in whose land you are now living. But as far as for me and my household, we will serve the Lord. I'm going to come on the floor with you for a little bit. Well, there's a story there that one after another after another, God had a plan to deliver his, his people. And one thing after another after another happened that required him to show up. I think about the camp with all those experiences that you heard of. We heard the testimony. He said, listen, you saw this with your own eyes. But some of them were there with a different understanding. Some of them were there, were, you know, just dragging along, having a hard time with everything that murmuring and murmuring. We know that we went from we went from manna to quail. God just hammered them with that because there was murmuring. But to the ones who were praying earnestly about the deliverance of God, they got to see the fulfillment of their prayers through the obedience of their actions. And as a result, God provided. Amen. Then you hear Joshua, you know, as for me and my house, we're going to serve the Lord. But listen to what he said. If serving God is undesirable to you, then go back to the fake, you know, God, small g. They're no gods at all. They're called idols. Go back to them. Or the idols of the Amorites, go to them. Go, go do whatever you want. You know, pet a rock, do something, I don't know. Or you can serve the one true God. And so, you know what, I think about the ministry that I'm involved in with Rhonda as we have traveled the journey for a very long time. Man, for a long time, we've listened, we've done things that every fiber of my being said no. But God said yes. I'm going to tell you, that's where the rubber meets the road. Because we have choices to make in life. And, you know, ultimately, listen, Jesus struggled within the garden, right? He said you know, if it would be possible for this cup to pass, but not my will, but your will be done. And he went to the cross. And in our life, we had to come to terms many times. There's a lot of things that catch your eye. In our devotion this week, we were taking, talking about taking the high road or the highway. There's a lot of off-ramps that you can take. It's not the highway or the high road. <clears throat> but it doesn't take you to where God has called you to arrive in it. It also takes you on a diverted course, and you're not involved in the places that God's provision, deliverance, healing, all of those things are found. They're found in obedience. And that, so that's what we live. We live in it. Ron and I have learned to live in an environment that when God says to do something, man, we've done stuff that felt like your life was going to end. That the things that we got involved in, it's like, and then you're going to do this, Lord. Why? So if you try to analytically think your way through that in a natural man's mind, you'll end up in a nut ward somewhere having somebody feed you pills and putting cold rags on your head. Do you hear what I'm telling you? Because none of it makes sense. We don't have the overview. Right? But we know the one that does. Are you with me? Now I'm giving you, I'm taking you somewhere tonight because we got some things going on. Once again, the course of our life Rhonda's and mine have taken another direction. God's doing something with us that, you know, it's almost like hit the brakes. Pump the brake pedal on this one. Let's, let's navigate through this and be careful. Lord, we want to make sure we didn't miss anything. We want to hear you, right? We want to hear you. But when you ask God, 
You must believe or you should not believe that you've received anything from God. So when he gives you direction, you have to, you have to take it and then make application. You've got to make application now. And a lot of times on our journey of faith, that takes us to crazy places. In all those scriptures that I gave you that are based on the principles, the seven realities of experiencing God, every one of those scriptures will work as a grid in your life to help you sift out all the garbage and end up on a solid ground. Amen? Now, I tell you that because I tell you some crazy things. We've been through a lot of ministries over the years uh, and, and as a pastor, I started out as a lay person in the church, you know, and I remember as I was being prepared for pastoral ministries, and I remember working a full-time job and doing, dealing with all these different things, you know, I was dealing with counseling people on a Bluetooth and running a backhoe, you know, and, and it got crazy, and I remember the surrender to the call to say that I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to surrender to full-time ministry, and the, the call of being a pastor, that was on my life you know, before the foundations of the earth. But the response to it was something that I knew I had to consider what that really meant. And so on the journey, it took its course. And I remember coming on staff and for a couple, two or three years without a paycheck because the need was there, but there was no resources. And God directed our steps and we've seen awesome things happen. We developed, you know, a lot of Christian people from out of, you know, just the ashes, and we watch them rise up to be godly men and women of God. Amen? But a lot of the times on that journey, we got called to do things that we would never have done ourselves. Ever. And so now we're getting old. When I say that, I mean, Rhonda is, but anyhow. So... I'm getting old. Listen, I could feel it. I almost fell coming down the steps over here. I need somebody to come over here with a cane or something to help me down. The truth is we're getting old. And as we're getting old, we're saying, we've been talking to the Lord. As, as our church, church took another direction with what was going on on Friar Street, the food pantry, the things that we involved ourselves in so deeply. You know, I started out with a, a few boxes of, of groceries on the floor and grew into a pantry that was just massive. Seven-day-a-week pickup, you know, Two days open the general public with a massive influx of people. It was unbelievable the things that were going on. And as time was passing, we began to ask some questions. Who's going to take this baton from our hand? Because we're getting old. We can't hold this up like this anymore. So those were the questions. We began to try to prepare somebody to take that over and do this kind of thing. But God had a different plan. And as a result, we had to say goodbye to our building on Friar in the food pantry. And so which left us now, you know, in a completely different shoes because Next Step was tied to that building. And now Dave and Joy own the men's house. That's their home now. And if they want to do, you know, rehabilitation ministry, that's entirely up to them. But it left us in a place to really consider some things. God, what are you doing with our lives? Here's what we knew for sure from the, the scriptures I shared from you, the seven realities of experiencing God. Here's what I knew. It didn't involve sitting on a beach and getting dusty. That's a fun place to be, amen? I like that. It sounded very appealing. It's just not what God had for us. We started to prayerfully consider. And as we prayerfully considered, God, God started opening doors to show us something more clearly. And so now we found ourselves at a place that really brings us to, you know, wow, what do I believe about God? You know, I believe that he directs our steps. And with, you, you really got to hear what I'm saying. We came to a place that we just almost were breathless. Because when the weight of the reality of what God's asking in your life hits you, you got one of two things you can do. You can say yes or no. Do you hear what I'm telling you? You can say yes or no. But our pattern of life has not been to say no. And I'll, and I'll be honest, I think Rhonda, any of the gray hair that she has, which is very minimal con compared to this, is that what she has I caused. Because when I heard something the Lord said, I would bring it to her, and, and most of the time she'd heard it also. 
And so on the journey, we had to come to the conclusion of that the, the things that God has called us to, that he has now changed the course of our life. And so our experience here at Families of Faith is coming to a close. By the middle of May, you won't see us. But I promise you this, we are going to shake this world up for Jesus. It's not going to be here. It's not going to be here. It's not going to be even in this state. But it is going to be accomplishing the purposes of God. I actually have some more things for you to consider, so I'm going to go back to the pulpit. I felt like I had to come down to the floor because, you know, to try to communicate this, how do you put that into words of what we believe about our God? I've heard all these things. People ask, what are you doing? What's it look like? You know, all these different things. Let me tell you what we're doing. We're going to be unemployed. What we're going to do, we're going as volunteers because we're called to it. Do you hear what I'm saying? I understand when I started here, I was a volunteer, really. I was a volunteer because they didn't have a paycheck, right? And so God did a lot of things over a lot of years, and those are hard things to consider. But my prayer for everybody sitting in here tonight, I'm going to go back to the pulpit, and I'm going to ask you to prayerfully consider, what is God saying to you? What is the direction of the course of your life? I've got some truths I want you to hear. And then maybe that can be a grid that you, you do things in your life that you'll find yourself making goofy decisions like, like we just made that's going to change the course of our life. There's people who will tell you, are you kidding? At your age, you're going to walk away from a paid position into the land of, I have no idea, 100% yes. 100% yes. God's never failed us yet. And as a result, we forge ahead and we understand all we have to do is like what we've seen in our passage in Joshua chapter 24 is we have to consider all the things that he brought us through over the years that were impassable, impossible. And, and as a result, we look in the rearview mirror and we go, how in the world did we get here? I'll tell you how. God. Luke chapter 14, verse 28. Suppose somebody wants to build a tower won't you first sit down and estimate the cost to see if you have enough money to complete it? Well, let me tell you about counting the cost. Let me tell you about counting the cost. We're not talking about a financial thing here. We're talking about what does it cost you to be obedient to God? What does it cost you? It may cost you friendships. It may cost you a lot of different things. It may cost you an ability to climb a ladder in your current position. It may cost you getting fired from a job. When you consider the cost, it's going to cost something. Luke chapter 9, verse 23 and 24 says, Then he said to all of them, Whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves, take up their cross daily, listen, daily, and follow me. Whoever wants to save their life will lose it, and whoever loses their life for me will save it. That's one of my soapboxes. Preacher, I hear you talk about that all the time. Right! 100% correct. The reason is, you know, if I want to be a disciple of Jesus, I had to come to terms. What's the cost? The cost of being a disciple is I can never turn my hair, my ear from the GPS, the voice of the Lord. I don't get the option to say I'm going to take a right ear instead of going forward. It's not an option on our table. So when I consider if I want to be a disciple, it's not on the options, uh, it's not on your table. If you want to be a disciple, it's not on your table. You must deny yourself. What does that mean? Well, I'm going to have my own idea. Well, I don't like what the GPS said, so I'm going to turn where I want to. Not going to work. You got to deny yourself, right? You got to take up your cross. You know, the, the term taking up your cross, when you consider what is a cross, cross isn't a pretty good gold necklace hanging around your neck. That's a symbol of the cross. But the cross he's referring to is a Roman torture that takes the life of whosoever is on it. And so when he said take up your cross, I'm taking up my cross, and that simply means my own ideas, agendas, Interests, likes, dislikes, all that stuff is going on the cross of sacrifice. And I'm going to do that daily because when I don't, it's like flipping the GPS off and going about it my way. Amen? 
Then he says, whoever wants to save their life will lose it. But whoever loses their life for him and the, the sake of the gospel, they'll, they'll save it. And so we, we understand what it is. What is eternal life? To know the one true God, Jesus Christ, to whom he sent. I want to have life. I want to have abundant life. What does that look like? Well, it's going to be found on the, the altar of sacrifice. As I surrender my own agenda as Lord into the hands of the real Lord. And he directs my step. And when I hear him, then I got to do what he says. I got to do what he says. Matthew chapter 8, verse 18 through 22. When Jesus saw the crowd around him, he gave orders to cross over to the other side of the lake. Then a teacher of the law came to him and said, Teacher, I will follow you wherever you go. Boy, isn't that, I'll do whatever ministry you want me to do, Pastor. Well, gee, we need someone to clean the restrooms. Except that. Right? Or, you know, I want you to, I want you to allow the Lord really to speak into your lives. I want you to go on a fast from your cell phones. Or your computer. Oh, come on, Pastor. There's nothing wrong with that. I didn't say there was. I said, we're going to do some spiritual disciplines. This is what we're going to do. Oh, that's not a big hit. In fact, it's such a bad hit that when I do it in a, say something like that in a, in a Bible study, it's life application. You meet every week. I ask, how did how'd that work out this week? They go, what? What do you mean, what? We obviously had a breakdown in my communications because I must have been speaking in Portuguese or something. Amen? Something was going wrong. Here's Jesus' response. Understand, a teacher of the law came to him. He says, teacher, I will follow you wherever you go. Jesus says this. Foxes have dens and birds have nests, but the Son of Man has no place to lay his head. Another disciple said to him, Lord, first let me go bury my father. But Jesus said, follow me and let the dead bury the, their own dead. Well, does that sound harsh or what? You understand, we're talking about a period of time where people actually took care of their family all the way till they pass. So when I let me bury my father is requesting a period of time to take care of an elderly person till the day they die. You know what? You can get other people to take care of them. If God's got a mission. Now, that's, that's hard stuff. But Jesus said, if anybody loves their family more than me, they're not worthy of me. Why? Well, he's simply saying to have a navigation of your life, and as you follow it, it's going to take you places that breaks that comfort of that. Make sure they know Jesus and have a reunion in heaven. That's really not cool, Pastor. Amen? Nobody wants to. <laughs> All right, listen to this. James chapter 2, verse 14 through 24. We're not that far out. We'll, we'll get there tonight. It's a little long tonight. But I'm going somewhere. I want to get you on board with me. And then I want you to go out the door and consider what that really looks like in your own personal life. James chapter 2, verse 14 and following says, What good is it, my brothers and sisters, if somebody claims to have faith but has no deeds? Such, can such faith save them? Suppose a brother or sister is without clothes or daily food, and any one of you says to them, Go in peace and keep warm and well fed, but does nothing for their physical need. What good is it? In the same way, faith by itself, if it is not accompanied with action, is dead. But if somebody says to you, you have faith and I have deeds, show me your faith without deeds, and I will show you my faith with deeds. You believe that there is one God good, even demons believe that in Shrutter, you foolish person. Do you want evidence that faith without deeds is, de is useless? Was not our father Abraham considered righteous for what he did when he offered his son Isaac on the altar? You see, that his faith and his actions were working together, and his faith was made complete by what he did. And the scripture was fulfilled. Abraham believed God, and it was credited to him as righteousness, and he was called God's friend. You understand the way that you live is a testimony of what you believe about God. You hear what I'm saying? 
Inter interesting this passage that James refers to, you know, where Abraham taking Isaac to the altar. When Abraham took Isaac up to that altar, you know what he said to the folks standing there? We shall return. Abraham knew a truth that went beyond his own uh, physical understanding or, or panic or whatever. He knew if God allowed him to, to plunge that sword into his son's chest, he had the ability to raise him from the dead. But instead, God gave him a substitute, a ram caught in the thicket, as the substitute for the sacrifice of his son. But his faith in action is what was a credit to him as he did what God had told him to do. So consider, as we're, we're coming down, I've, I've got a story I'm going to read you. You're going to be a little over, sorry about that, but no. Remember the rea for, for, from... Uh, four through seven of the realities God speaks by his Holy Spirit through the Bible, prayer, circumstances, the church, to reveal himself, his purpose, and his ways. God's invitation for you, for you to work with him always leads you to a crisis of belief, which requires faith in action. You must make major adjustments in your life to join God in what he is doing. And you come to know God by experience as you obey him, and he accomplishes his work through you. Listen, God's invitation for you to work with him always leads you to a crisis of belief, right? It always leads you to have faith in action. He leads us, he shows us, he says, now what are you going to do? You're going to do this one on your own? Well, let me just tell you, there's a lot of hard things that we go through in ministry to try to find the purpose of God, the direction of God, all those things. One of the things you have to conquer is your emotions. They're very real. In following Jesus with your life, it costs other people also, right? You remember the scripture said, who builds a tower without first sitting down and calculating the cost? Well, let me tell you, there's a, there's a cost to people around you when you follow Christ. In some families, in some families, it breaks up families. They don't want nothing to do with this Jesus, right? They won't even talk to you because you're a follower of Christ, Right? But it costs others something. And sometimes it costs loved ones some things too. We got some people here that we love dearly. And as we travel along, we're going to miss them, I promise you. And it's going to cost them. Some of them actually love. But I got a lot of people. Let me just tell you this disclaimer. I've got a lot of people that have gone through Next Step that absolutely hate me. Come on up here. No, the truth of it is, you know, because I've said things that they don't want to hear. Dave has said a lot of stuff they don't want to hear. And the truth of it is that there are some that will find what's happening awful. They're going to have mixed emotions. They're going to have woulda, shoulda, coulda. I want to tell you, take all of that kind of thinking and just flush it down the toilet. It's pointless and it's counterproductive. I'll read you a story about Hudson Taylor. Hudson Taylor was a great man of prayer and faith. He responded to God's call to go to China as a missionary. And in 1866, Hudson left his country and family to go to China. By the end of his life, 1905, he had, met, he had been used by God to found, to found the church inland mission where there were 205 preaching stations, 849 missionaries, and 125,000 Chinese Christians. A testimony of a life absolutely surrendered to God, Hudson Taylor describes something of the cost he and his mother experienced as he obeyed God's will to go to China as a missionary. These are the words of Hudson Taylor. He said, My beloved mother... Now sainted mother had come to see me off from Liverpool. Never shall I forget the day, nor how she set, she went with me into my little cabin that was to be my home for nearly six long months. With my mother's loving hand, she smoothed the little bed. She sat by my side and joined me in the last hymn that we should sing together before the long parting. We knelt down and she prayed. 
the last mother's prayer I was to hear before starting for China. The notice was given that we must separate. And we had to say goodbye, never expecting to meet again on earth. For my sake, she restrained her feelings as much as possible. We parted, and she went along on shore, giving me her blessing. I stood alone on the deck, and she followed the ship as we moved toward the dock gates. As we passed through the gates, and the separation reality really commenced. I shall never forget the cry of anguish wrung from that my mother's heart. When I went through, and it went through me like a knife, I never knew fully until then what God so loved the world meant. And I am quite sure that my precious mother learned more of the love of God to the perishing in that hour than in all her life before. Wow. Understand the love God has for us, the love God has for the perishing. It takes somebody that's going to have to be the Hudson Taylor. It's going to have to go to where they don't want to go. Maybe it looks appealing where you want to go. Make no mistake when the call of God is on it, it's going to require things in some of its separation. And when you consider what occurred here and you hear the testimony, I don't know about you, but I've read this story. I've had it for years, and it, and it challenges me. Anytime I get on the pity pot of life, I consider what it is to really have sacrifice to be a mission pastor or missionary. To understand the love of God, God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten son, right? In other words, the redeeming blood of Jesus cost a separation of the son and the father. And in the moment of the considering the cost, as Hudson Taylor seen his mother as the, the ship pulled away and it got smaller he, and he heard the anguished cries of his own mother, guarded when together. You know, mothers will always try to protect their kids from pain, amen? they rather take the pain themselves. And I'm sure when she went home that night, her pillow was saturated with tears. But the price that was paid was for others. The Great Commission, it's very real, and it costs us much. We have to consider the cost. But to fail, to fail to do what God has called us to do, costs us much, much more. It costs others a great deal. And if you would consider the fact that the price has been paid for the redemption of those that God has called you to reach. And he says, now, even if you have to go, and, and, and as, you, as you look back and you see figures on the horizon, the reality of it is somebody's eternal destiny lay, hangs in the balance of your obedience. Matthew 6.33 says this, But seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these will be given to you as well. Psalm 37.4 has been one that's molded my life for a long time. Take the light in the Lord, and he will give you the desires of your heart. Well, there you have it. There you have it. So we got a journey, and it's full of uncertainty. We don't know. We don't know. We know where. And we know that the Lord has put burdens on our heart. He's opened doors of opportunity through contacts to deal with some people, some very powerful people that get stuff done for the Lord. And as we come in as volunteers, wherever the Lord takes that, I'm, if it, that's what we're doing till the day we die, I'm cool with that. But the truth of it is, what about in your life? What about in your life? Do we hear certain things and immediately... I remember Emily, we brought her to the hospital. Emily doesn't like hospitals at all. Hospital vi visits are very difficult, especially when the person you're going to see is in grave condition. And I remember her pushing through that 
barrier in her life, and she went with us to a very critical hospital visit. Changed her. You know, because we have a guard, it just pops up. That I don't want to do it, so then the answer is no. You know, Brother Dave, I love Brother Dave. He is a crusty old bird. In the name of Jesus. You know, listen. His goatee's got gray in it. It's white. It ain't even gray. He's trying to compete with Domingo. But the truth of it is he loves Jesus and he wants to, he's compelled to help people. He just had a phone call. I, I'm talking to him about it. I said, Dave, you need to understand something. Don't allow the defeat of people who refuse to allow the navigation of God to govern their life. Change the tone is we have a Jesus that changes lives. We have a Jesus that if somebody surrenders to his power and they say, I will listen to him every time, not when I like what I hear, now, you know, I just want to see what kind of ministry I'm interested in. You know, I want to plug it in the church. Baloney, malarkey. How about, I want to see where God's at work and I want to meet him. And I don't care what that cost, I don't care what it means to take my ideas to the altar of sacrifice and say, God, I want to accomplish yours. And in that hour of decision, you know, we got to get past the knee-jerk response because there's so many people. And I'm telling you, as a pastor that's been here for a long time, I could come in, and if you've ever been around and I bring in a sign-up sheet, and it's got, you know, it's for something big, and you say, what, are you, what, what am I signing up for? You don't need to know that. And I won't tell you. So if you can't put your name on this, and it, listen, it's a lottery, folks. We're going to pull something out, and you could be the janitor. You might be part of a drama. You might be going on the road. Domingo was a bus captain with a bunch of high school kids going to Louisiana. Are you kidding? He tries to get in the truck with us. And we go, oh, no, no, no. You're on the bus with the kids. Oh, do we not tell you you're the bus captain? You hear what I'm saying? But, you know, listen. I want you guys, we're going to pray. We're going to get out of here. But I want to get this tied in the bowl and want you get your mind wrapped around it. You know what we did to Domingo? That wasn't very fair, was it? I remember Pastor Randy telling me, we see Domingo trying to come our way. He goes, oh, man, Domingo's coming over here. Oh, we're going to have to break the news now. He's the bus captain. You know, that was like it was like somebody standing on the deck of a pool and you pushed him in the water. Because the next thing that he knew, he was on the interstate with a bus full of kids. You hear what I'm saying? But he experienced amazing things that we wanted to usher him into, amazing things. That maybe the next time you hear something, you say, yeah, sign me up. What is it? I don't care. Whenever the next time the Lord says, I want you to speak to somebody, I want you to come out, I want you to speak to somebody right now. I don't know what to say. When my Bible says you don't need to worry about what to say, he'll give you the words that you need when you need them. And so when you consider these things and you put it all together, what is your life going to look like? Because, listen, I drove through the neighborhood yesterday. Whew. I've seen them streets for a long time. And I drove through and I looked. There was one guy out in his yard. He's one of the Shannon Billies. Listen. He's an old man now. You hear what I'm telling you? When I drove by, my, the air went out of my lungs. Because I knew him when he had black hair and he was a young man. And those years passed like nothing. And I would have to say to you, do you want another day to pass that you're not in the center of God's will? Do you want another day to pass that you say no to God because it doesn't appeal to our likings? The one that wants to save their life will lose it. But the one that will lose their life for Jesus and the sake of the gospel will find it. You'll find yourself right in the middle of a purpose that God wants to do in your life. But you have to say, yes, Lord, and whatever that means, that's what it means. I don't know where you're at spiritually. I don't know where your journey has taken you. But I know this. Hudson Taylor got on a ship, sat there with his precious mother. I can't imagine what her night before that visit looked like at home. Nor his. Because they knew that there was going to be a time that you're going to hear an announcement that says, Everybody that's on board that's not going on this journey is getting off right now. 
and the severing of that was going to be right there. You know, this, his testimony said, the last time I seen my mother, never to see her again on earth. He had to say, here's the balance. Here's all these people God has called me to reach. I could say to hell with them. My brother get a charge out of that. I said that at a Luis Palau thing one time. I said, what these people? Say to hell with these people? And he said, oh! I said, well, they're not going to heck. You hear what I'm telling you? So when we look and we consider, we have to say, God, if you're going to use me to accomplish this purpose, God, give me a heart to say, help me to follow you. No matter I like the scenery, I don't like it. I want to accomplish a purpose. I don't want to be, I want to be part of the solution, not part of the problem. I want to say, Lord, call me. Here I am. And allow your life to navigate somebody else's in the right direction. Don't have knee-jerk reactions. Don't say things right out of the tip of your tongue. Because guess what? What comes out of your mouth first is probably wrong. So let God have that place. I challenge you to live for Him. When you get to be older, some of you are already, that horse left the barn a long time ago. But the truth of it is, when you stand before the Lord, you want to be able to look back on some of these experiences. I did with a Shanna Billy. You know, I was there. You know, I was there for deaths in their family. I was there for a lot of things. And I'm looking over. I've never been able to leave this, live, lead this individual to Jesus. I think he's getting ready to have a visit. Do you hear what I'm saying? Whatever the Lord wants to do in your life, we're going to have an invitation now. We do one every week. We do one every time I preach. I always give an opportunity to say, listen, do you hear anything tonight? You get challenged in some way to say, you know, my navigation system, I turn it off. And I just go ahead and I just do what seems right to me. And then I and then I go to church and, and I do some religious things. I even have a devotion every now and then. But the truth of it is, is God is looking for the intimacy of knowing the one true God in Jesus Christ in whom he sent. That is eternal life. And the mission starts now. Are you with me? Counselors, if you come on up here. I just have an opportunity for you to respond. If you got something going on in your life that you're really confused about, say, Lord, I want you to clear it up. I want you to clear it up. But I want to be bold enough to say, I want to follow you, Lord, no matter what that looks like. I'm going to seek counsel so I end up doing things according to the scriptures that navigate our lives, not knee-jerk stuff anymore. God, I'm tired of going the wrong way. I want to go the right way. I want to do it your way. I want to enter one day before you on the credentials of Jesus to hear the words, Well done, thou good and faithful servant. Not depart from me, you do of iniquity, I never knew you. As the music plays, would you respond?